In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is in our Beloved in Christ. During the service this morning, I was thinking about a metaphor that I'll share with you, and then I'll go on with my homily. But it's a simple one, but it's a beautiful one. What happens when you set a, a cold piece of coal next to a burning piece of coal? When you set a cold piece of coal next to a burning, what happens to the cold one? It ignites. It ignites. I did that this week, actually. I didn't realize I had a piece of, of charcoal already on the sensor, and then I put another piece in, and it sputtered, and it surprised me. And... Uh, I was thinking about my ministry, and I want to be like a burning coal. When you're close to me, I want you to ignite with the flame of the love for, of God, with zeal and energy and delight, and also the heat of struggle as we work out our salvation together and we seek to give light and warmth to the world. The saints are like coal, too. The saints are like coal, and we want to get as close to them as we can. They've been ignited by the Holy Spirit through and through, and united with God, transparent to the very energy of God. So today, I want to ask you one question, another question, as we get started. Today is a special day for us Orthodox Christians in America. Do you know why? I gave you a hint. Special day for us Orthodox Christians in America. I give you a hint on that little stand right there. A little stand. St. Innocent. Innocent. Yeah, today's the feast day of St. Innocent. And um, St. Innocent of? Alaska. Okay, good. Thank you. Not everyone knows, but some of you do, I know. Today's the feast day of St. Innocent of Alaska. It's also the feast of St. Thomas. But St. Innocent of Alaska, whom we refer to as equal to the apostles, an enlightener of North America. We have a lot of saints from other lands because, well, America is fairly young as a country. And the missionaries only came a couple hundred years ago. And we know the Orthodox missionaries came through Eastern Europe, Siberia, Russia, and into Alaska. Not across the Atlantic, like those who were fleeing from Western Europe, seeking religious freedom. But they came to reach the indigenous people of Alaska. And there, there are forebears in preaching the gospel in North America. So I want to tell you a little bit about St. Innocent today. A little bit, and then offer some, just some reflections on what we can learn from St. Innocent. You may not know much about him. Let's get to know him. Let's try to draw near to the warmth of the coal of St. Innocent. He was born in 1797, not that long ago. 1797, to a poor family in a remote village in a rural area of Irkutsk, which is kind of south-central south uh, Russia, almost like the, on the, the border of southern Russia. And uh, when, he was at the, when he was age six, he was orphaned. He was orphaned. And he was sent to a seminary. Kind of like monasteries, the seminaries would serve as places of orphanage, orphanage and refuge for children who didn't have the care that they needed. Shortly after he arrived, the relics of St. Innocent of Irkutsk were found whose name the apostolic ministry, uh, young Yohan, or John, he would later inherit that name, Innocent. He was a hard-working and outstanding student who also was seen as humble and kind. And for these qualities, he was given the name Venyaminov, after the late Bishop Venyamin, which is Russian for Benjamin, of Irkutsk. So he was known as John Venyaminov. 
After he was ordained to the priesthood later, he spent a year as a parish priest in Irkutsk. He was married and ordained. And then he volunteered to go into missionary work in Alaska. I think in one of the stories I was reading about, uh, about his life, and they said when he agreed to go as a missionary to Alaska, his wife started crying. <laughs> That's a long way to go all the way to Alaska from Russia, from central Russia. Many other clergy were afraid to go because they heard it was a wild country full of dangerous savages. His wife broke into tears. She heard the news of the mission, but she was unable to dissuade him. So at the age of 26, he and his family traveled over 2,000 miles, taking over a year to complete this arduous journey and arrived finally in the Aleutian Islands in 1824. One of the things that was wonderful about St. Innocent is that he was creative. He worked with his hands. He was extremely intelligent, but he also knew how to build things. He built a church by himself with his own hands. In another one of the lives I was reading, it said that he, he built clocks and he was always fixing things. The devil couldn't have his way with him because his hands were never idle. That's for sure. He traveled to remote areas by kayak. They had these little, little wooden frame boats with skins stretched out over the frames that they would use to go into remote areas that were hard to navigate by larger boat or that were inaccessible by foot. So they would go in by kayak. And in some of the icons, you'll see him and other Alaskan missionaries canoeing to go evangelize or to reach the natives who are already Orthodox and minister to them. Sometimes you'll see pictures of them on dog sled. And also the kids will like this. Sometimes he even traveled by reindeer to get where he was going. He learned six dialects. So he spoke his native language, but no other language. So he had to go and learn the language of the people. He learned six dialects of the native language. And he developed like St. Cyril and Methodius, who developed the Cyrillic alphabet as they ministered to um, the barbarians of the Eastern European lands. He developed, St. Innocent developed the first written alphabet of the natives in Alaska. And then of course, he started translating the Bible and other sacred books into their language. It's interesting to think that he didn't go in and say, you need to learn Russian, you know? He said, I'm gonna, he, in, he invested time in meeting them where they were at, getting to know them, to understand them, and to speak their language. When you love something, when you love someone, you'll invest the time to get to know them and meet them where they're at even if it means a lot of work. And especially if you have faith in God's calling on your life. If you have faith that it's God that's at work within you, bringing you to serve and to love those to whom you're called, then you'll do whatever it takes to reach them and meet them where they're at. And I see in St. Innocent a beautiful example of this kind of sacrificial love, which God enabled him to embody in the wild lands of Alaska. Years later, he also translated scriptural books into other Alaskan native languages. Well, I already learned one and created an alphabet for one. I might as well go do it with several others. He also studied all aspects of the local area. He got to know what the people were like, how they lived, what they did, what they believed in. One of the things, another thing so profound, he didn't go in and say, these savages, let's civilize them. What do they know intuitively about the goodness of the world that they live in? And he allowed that to be the starting point of his evangelism. This is how the successful missionaries like St. Herman of Alaska also reached the native Alaskans. 
Okay. He wrote ethnographic, geographic, and linguistic works, for which later he was elected an honorary member of the Russian Geographical Society. I don't think that was his goal, but they went ahead and just, you know, pinned that on him for the work that he did. And Moscow Royal University. Later, he returned to Russia to seek more resources and support for the Alaska mission, where after his wife had passed away, he then took monastic vows and the name Innocent after Bishop Innocent of Irkutsk. He was later consecrated Bishop. That's why we call him Bishop Innocent and was assigned to the new see of Kamchatka Kurils and the Aleutian Islands to which he returned, tirelessly building churches, guiding priests, seeking to bring the gospel and the Holy Orthodox Church to the native peoples of Alaska. He encouraged the use of English language and the use of indigenous clergy. So what he wasn't into colonialism, raising up indigenous clergy. And he was later made archbishop and then, having returned to Russia, ultimately became Metropolitan of Moscow. So that's why we see Apostle to America, also Metropolitan of Moscow, where he, you know, you can't do everything your own, especially as you get older. You have to raise up leaders. And so that's what he did. He started a missionary society. He's perhaps especially remembered for his zeal to bring the gospel to the world. The apostolic preaching of Metropolitan innocence spread to a vast territory, including tons of islands and tribes. There are about 20 here that I'm not going to try to pronounce. Preaching God, the gospel was a, his primary achievement. And, he, and it occupied a special place in, in his service. He had a great gift of homiletics. He was a remarkable preacher. When he spoke about preaching, he said, Woe to him who is called and ordained to propagate the word of the gospel and does not do so. Woe to the one who withholds the gospel from those who need to hear the gospel. And he said, You must convey to your listeners the essential message of, the, of all of Jesus Christ's teaching, that we repent, that we believe in him and nourish a selfless and pure love for him and all of mankind. If you're to win your listeners' hearts, you must speak from your heart. For it's the strength of our heart's feeling that moves us to speak. So only one who is filled to overflowing with faith and love will be able to speak with a wisdom which his listeners' hearts will be unable to resist. Maybe someday you'll be unable to resist my words. I'm working on it. He fell asleep in the Lord on March 31st, 1879. He was buried on April 5th at the Trinity St. Sergius Lavra, which is a monastery in Russia. And in 1977, so a hundred years later, a hundred years later, at the request of the Orthodox Church in America, he was proclaimed a saint in the church. And his feast day celebrated twice on the year of his repose and on the year, the day of his glorification, which is October 6th. So taking a cue from St. Innocent, especially his missionary zeal, I want to give a little exhortation. Beseeching his intercessions that we might gather some of the warmth from him and learn from his blessed example. The Christian identity has always been associated with mission. The Christian identity has always been associated with mission. We have the injunction to preach and to teach and to live the gospel, to make the gospel available where we live and throughout the world. So our mission begins in our most immediate context, Right here, right here. Our mission begins here. I love the image from the prophecy of Ezekiel when Ezekiel was told to eat the scroll. 
Eat the scroll of the word of God. And we have to eat the scroll of the word of God. Seeking to internalize the, the personal calling to life in Christ. This is the immediate context for our mission. Each of us hearing and responding to the call of Christ unto himself. And constantly converting. Each of us must be constantly converting to Christ. Always asking of ourselves. What's next in this process of conversion? What's next for me? How can I continue to enter more profoundly and more sincerely into the life in Christ? And then it extends beyond ourselves. Doing it internally is not enough. It has to extend into our homes, into our families, and into the broader context of our lives. Our friends, our friend groups, workplaces, cities, countries. One powerful conviction that has been with me recently comes from just this simple fact. We live in Briar, Washington. I live in Briar. Our church is in Briar, Wash, physically in Briar, Washington. Here we are in Briar, Washington. Okay? The population of Briar is about 7,000. 7,000. Do you know how many churches are in Briar? Any guesses? Two. Two churches in Briar. What? Two churches for 7,000 people. Now we have other churches in the surrounding areas, but just bear with me. 7,000 people in Briar, Washington. In Briar, there are two small churches. Ours being one of them. And I wonder, I wonder how many of those residents of Briar know that we're here. And I wonder how many of the residents in Briar know that orthodoxy is available to them. How many know that? I was looking at the map this week thinking, we have at least 10 homes you know, adjoin, adjoining our property here. Do they know that they're welcome to come and see us? Do they even know that orthodox people are Christians? Remember that story I told you once about the guy on the airplane? I told him who I was. I was an Orthodox priest. And he said, like Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox? Well, I'm an Orthodox Christian. And he goes, oh, I've heard of Russian Orthodox or Greek Orthodox, but I didn't know that they were Orthodox Christians. <laughs> I mean, do, do the people around us know? So these are the kinds of things I'm thinking about now. Do they know that the beauty of Orthodoxy is available to them? It seems we need to consider that there's no inf offense. There's no offense in beginning to let our neighbors know who we are. And convincing them that we love them. And that we care about them. I know many of our parishioners live outside of the Briar Linwood area. You know what that means for you? It means that our mission field is extended to your neighborhoods too. Our presence should cause us to question do those around us know about Orthodox Christianity? And how can I share it with them? St. Innocent left his home. And he traveled for a year in order to live in rustic conditions. The first home he lived in was a dugout in the ground. A traditional uh, Alaskan home called the Barabara, where they would dig out a home in the dirt. Maybe his wife cried a little more when they <laughs> moved into that. Eventually, he did build a home. And actually, my wife has pictures. She, she was there at his home in Sitka uh, this, this, last, uh, this last fall, well, summer, during the summer. He experienced hardships and deprivations. But also, he experienced the Holy Spirit and the power of God. Like we heard in today's gospel reading. Excuse me, today's epistle reading. St. Paul was enumerating all of the trials, tribulations, difficulties, trials, travails. And he said, but we also experience the Holy Spirit and the power of God. We can say the same of St. Innocent. And he did it in order to bring sanctity to this new land, holiness to this new land of North America. He worked hard in order to save some. And in this way, a serious inspiration he is.
for those of us who live here in this country, this country that really knows very little about Orthodox Christianity. I've been repeating this thought, and this is where the challenge comes in for us. If you've been around for some of the, the evening services and heard me give my little, little reflections and homilies after the services, you've heard me create this little connection. But in our country, we have the freedom of religion. In our country, we have the freedom of religion, a constitutionally protected right. See, in the United States, we have a great freedom and for us, it's a joy to be able to cultivate our faith without governmental intervention and even with a certain amount of respect and privilege that's afforded to us by the government. We have freedom of religion. But this freedom, when we're granted it as a freedom, it means we also have the option of acting upon our beliefs. We have the option of worshiping. And I think that if we have the option, then it also becomes a luxury for us. If it's a freedom, then it's an option. If it's an option, it's a luxury. And I'm concerned that sometimes we treat it that way. But luxuries are not worth dying for. Luxuries are not worth dying for. And I dare say that luxuries, excuse me, that which is not worth dying for may not be worth living for. So therefore, while we have the freedom to assemble and to worship and to pray and to speak of our faith, it'd be a shame for us not to utilize the freedom that we have to creatively convey the beauty of orthodoxy to, the, to a world that's parched and longing, I think, for what we have to offer. We don't have anything to sell. We're not here to market Christianity. We've seen marketing of Christianity done well and poorly. I have in my background. But usually the marketing of the faith results either in those who are offended or only temporarily satisfied customers. So what do we have to offer? What do we have to offer? I promise I'm bringing it to a conclusion. What do we have to offer? I think we have to offer that which is worth living for and that which is worth dying for. But in order for our witness to be authentic, it must be convincing, not marketable, but true. If we believe, I've, I've told people, asceticism is a hard sell, you know? Asceticism, self-deprivation, fasting, but when you realize what a joy, what a freedom it is to throw off every weight in the pursuit of God is worth it. If we believe that Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and that the church is his very body, we must be driven by a powerful longing for everyone to know Christ. For everyone to be set forth with the opportunity to be united to him in his church. We can't force it. The local parish must be essentially a theanthropic organism. A unity of divinity and humanity. It must be. But it also must be a missionary society. The church must be a missionary society. Constantly burdened with the creative responsibility of preaching the gospel. By its dynamic manner of life. It's exceptionally countercultural convictions. It's manifestation of celestial wisdom and revelation of heaven on earth. This reality that's manifested in every divine liturgy. So inspired by Saint Innocent, a couple of things. We're, we're Christians. We're Christians. So all that we are, all that we do, and how we relate should be informed by our faith. We live in a day and age of compartmentalization, and we need to remember that I'm no less or more Christian here than I am anywhere else. I'm no less Christian here than I am there, no more Christian here than I am there, wherever I may be. Therefore, I should constantly strive to be cognizant of the wonderful responsibility of being a vessel of redemption everywhere that I am. And if each of us individually, then all the more is a God-inspired community. As each of us 
gathers up that warmth of faith and life and light in Christ, we should be constantly uniting, igniting one another, igniting and inspiring one another. And we have the calling to make our faith in its fullness available to America. This is our responsibility. It's a terrible tragedy that orthodoxy has been referred to as America's best kept secret. You heard that? America's best kept secret, you know? Lord have mercy on us. I think it's sinful for us to have such a wealth of wisdom and beauty and to keep it to ourselves as if it were a secret. We have to hold the burden and the responsibility and the yoke and awesome calling of sharing our faith with the whole world, with the whole world. And I believe that we'll be held to account before our Savior. I think he'll ask us, you received my love. You received my love, did you give it? What did you do with those talents that I've given you? We have to make the riches of our humble and beautiful life in Christ available. I want to quote the Apostle Paul in conclusion. He spent his life laboring in his words that some might be saved. And he says in Romans, How then shall they call on him who have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, indeed. Their sound has gone out into all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. So I hope it will be also said of us that our sound has gone out into all of Briar, into all of Linwood, to all of South Snohomish County and North King County, and our words to the ends of the unchurched lands of the Pacific Northwest. We have to be Orthodox Christians and we have to live the Orthodox life. Let us pray to the Lord of, harvest, of the harvest and seek the inspiration and prayers of the apostles of our land that our feed would be made beautiful by the preaching of the gospel of peace to those around us, powerfully, authentically, beautifully, and even convincingly in both word and deed, providing to everyone in this new land the opportunity to know Christ by the Holy Spirit for their coal to be ignited by the warmth of our coal, to be united to his one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Amen.